So you want to drive a forklift? Well, before you get on the forklift, there are things you need to know. Things like how to make the area safe, what rules and regulations there are, making your forklift safe, knowing how to drive the forklift, what the controls do, what the forklift can do. My video is going to take you through some of these things. Or it's going to take you through all these things. Please watch and enjoy. I also have a series of videos that you can watch to show you how to drive. Training materials are supplied by Easy Guides Australia. They supply all training materials for high risk work licenses in Australia. If you need any of their materials for training, please follow the link below. Let's start with what is a forklift truck? A forklift truck industrial truck used to lift and move loads. It has a mast and it has an load carriage with other load holding parts on it. Not all these forklifts will be able to drive with an LF license. There are two here that you can't. You've got the order picker and you've got a narrow aisle uh, forklift truck. Those ones you need an LO license, not an LF. Counterbalance forklift, rough terrain, walkie reach stacker, sit on reach truck, you'll be able to drive those with an LF license. Now, why is it called a counterbalance forklift? Very simply, it has a point of balance and it has a counterweight, hence the word counterbalance. All the weight behind the point of balance is the counterweight. All the weight in front of the point of balance is the weight. The point of balance is at the bottom of the front tyre. It's a line drawn down the middle of the tyre where the point reaches the ground. That is your point of balance. There are many different parts on a forklift. We will cover them in a later video. In your pre-start checks, operational checks, We'll cover all points. Forklift controls. Different types of forklifts have different types of controls. Now just like any other machine out there, you've got many different brand names and each of their own brands put their own controls inside to operate your forklift. Same with forklifts, same with any other device or machine out there. So you need to learn your controls before you start driving your forklift. How are you going to learn about your controls? Well, you can always check the operator's manual for information about the controls, what they do before you start using the forklift. You can have someone who's competent to, and experienced to train you on that particular forklift. You'll also need time to practice the controls and have a feel to know what that machine is doing. Now every company have got their own rules and regulations so you need to know and comply with the rules and regulations of that company. Some companies may be working with dangerous goods, some companies may be working with food and there will be other rules, laws and controls put in place. Most of these rules and laws and controls that are being put in place, there are some sort of guidelines that they have to follow. So if you need to know what the rules are, what you can do with the forklift, what you can do with the load and how to operate and how to move it safely, you can go to the forklift's manufacturer's instructions such as the operator's manual, you can go to your safe work job procedures, the company will have procedures in place, specific workplace policies and procedures, oh and his workplace representatives should know the rules and laws, plans by managers, codes of practice, guidelines for safe operating of a forklift and its attachments, OH&S or wh policies and procedures, 
health and safety acts and regulations, which can be found at safeworkaustralia.com, or you can go to the industrial standards, which are standards.org. Operating a forklift can be very dangerous. That's why you need a license to operate a forklift. The only way you can get a license is by going to an accredited registered training organisation in Australia. Um, to pass and get your license, you need to pass the practical test to show that you are competent in driving that machine. You also have to pass a knowledge assessment. There's also a basic calculations assessment to pass to get your license. Now we have covered what a forklift is, let's cover some basic rules and regulations and laws that go with it. They're important to know to prevent anyone from getting injured, anyone getting hurt or any damage in the house. We'll start with duty of care. Who has the duty of care? Everyone. You've got the employers, contractors, contractors, outworkers, employers of labour hire companies, volunteers, managers, designers, importers, suppliers, inspectors. Everyone has a duty of care within the company. Now, as a worker, your duty of care is, by law, take care of your own health and safety. Take care of the health and safety of other people in the workplace because of the things you do or forget to do. Do your best to follow workplace health and safety, occupation health and safety uh, requirements by your CBU or employer. Do not misuse anything provided at the workplace for OH&S or WH&S either deliberately or recklessly. Do not work if you believe a hazard would be a serious risk to your health and safety. Your PCBUs, employers duty of care, by law as an employer, provide a workplace that is safe without risk to people's health and safety. Provide information, training, so that work will be done safely. Provide safe plant equipment and structures. Put systems in place to work safely. Provide uh, ways to make sure plant structures and substances are handled and stored safely. There are consequences for not following your duty of quick care. Penalties. If you are an employer or even a worker, no one can escape. Even a worker, the government can fine you or even imprison you for failing your duty of care. Especially if someone gets seriously injured or even loses their life in the workplace. Classes of high risk work, work licences. There are many classes of high risk work licences as you can see here. The main ones we are interested in is forklift operations and order picker operations. And earth moving equipment is not included in the Australian standards. Doing work without a high-risk license. Yes, you can do work without a high-risk license, but here in Australia, there are two stipulations put in place before you can use that machine without a license. The first stipulation is that you are enrolled in an RTO to get a license for that machine you're using. The second stipulation is that you are being supervised by someone the same class of high-risk license for the work you are doing. You do need to produce evidence that you are either licensed or that you're training in an RTO to prove that you can do these jobs. Either supervise or drive that machine. You use your license or evidence that you're training for uh, training for the license with a registered training organisation. Maintaining competency. 
Now, a lot of times, a lot of people may get promoted in the industry, they may leave the job and do another job and then come back to the industry, and their license may still be valid. But if they've been a period of time away from the machine, example a year, maybe two years, their competency levels may drop. The skill levels will drop because you haven't used that machine on a regular basis. So if that's the case and it's happened to you, you've done another job and you thought you'd go back to do warehousing, you jump on a forklift, well, once you have a high risk license, you need to keep experienced and up to date. Maintain competency and current skills. If you're no longer competent, you must not do high risk work even if you have a license. You must retrain to become competent or give back your license to health and safety regulators. Renewing your license. Your license is only valid for five years. After five years, you will need to renew your license. After five years, your license has finished. It's no longer valid. You do need to update it. You have 12 months after five years to renew your license. You neglect to renew your license after 12 months, you'll have to redo the course again. It is your responsibility to make sure that you are still driving with a valid license. Your legal responsibility when doing high risk work is to work carefully, look after your own health and safety. You must make sure your work does not harm the health and safety of yourself or others. Penalties for not doing high risk work safely you may not be able to renew your license. You may have your license suspended or cancelled. You may have to do your high risk license test again to make sure you can do the work safely and competently. You may be prosecuted and have to go to court. So you've gone to work, you've got your license, and you've never driven this forklift before at work. What is your boss's responsibility? Your boss's responsibility at this stage is to make sure that you are competent in driving that machine. And if you're not, he needs to give you training. He has to make you familiar with that forklift. He needs to make sure you have a trainer, uh, someone training you who is experienced in that forklift. And you must be supervised driving that forklift while you are training. Planning your work and tasks. Before you start work, you need to know your task requirements. Why do you need to know your task requirements? So you can plan your job to avoid it from hazards, to be able to keep people safe, to minimise your risks. Things you need to plan for would be, who would you need to communicate with? If you're working in a particular area, you want people to stay out that area. So you'll communicate and say, I'm driving a forklift here, please stay out. Attachment methods for the load. You don't know what type of load, have a look at the load and you'll work out what attachments you might need. You may need extended forks. You may need a pallet grabber. You may, may need a drum grabber, grabber. You may need a jib attachment. So what type of attachments do I need on the forklift to lift this load? Where will you do the lift? What will you need to do when you get there? What equipment do you need? Is the equipment there? So you might be able to set up communi well, while communicating with people, set up barricades, set up your exclusion zones, maybe flashing lights you might need to warn people you're working in that area. Work permits. Here in Australia, we need work permits to work on construction sites. Some places may need work permits to work on them. They may be a secure place. Do you need a work permit to work here? Does the load have any special features? What is the weight of the load? You need to know that. Then compare that to the capacity of the forklift. Is that load within the capacity of that forklift I am using? Do I need a different forklift? Blind spots. Blind spots could be anywhere, coming through doorways, uh, corners of buildings, 
going around in racking. Many places you could have spine spots, you'll have to use your horn. Where will you need to use your horn? Hazards and risks. Let's start with, what is a hazard? A hazard is anything or a situation that could harm, injure you or even kill you. In other words, it's anything that can hurt you. What is a risk? A risk is a chance of a hazard causing harm, such as injury, illness, or even death. In other words, it's how likely that someone or something may be harmed by the hazard. Let's take a forklift for example. A forklift is a hazard. It's dangerous, it can harm, it can kill, and it can injure. It can also destroy equipment. Okay. What we need to do is reduce the risk of that happening. How would we reduce the risk to minimise the chance of that hazard harming someone? Well, we would communicate with people, we will set up barricades, signage up in the area, following our policies and procedures, we'll reduce the risk of that forklift, that danger, harming people or damaging equipment. Site inspection. Before we start work, you do need to inspect your site for hazards. Hazards could be outside, hazards could be inside. Now some things, some things that you may find inside, this only covers a small portion. We may need to look up over our heads, we look for service lines, uh, possible non-weight bearing surfaces, we've got areas with poor lighting we may have to uh, light up. Pedestrians could be running around the area. We've got doorways and blind corners. We've got surface conditions. We've got obstructions in our way, ground bearing pressure, dangerous materials in the area. We've got other equipment in the area. That's just inside. Now we can look for hazards that are outside. We've got weather conditions, wind, lightning, rain, heat. We've got surrounding structures like buildings. We've got ramps and slopes. We've got ground conditions, wet surfaces, dry surfaces. We've got other plant equipment. We've got railway crossings, pedestrians, vehicle traffic, underground services, bridges, loading dock edges, trees, power lines. So hazards can be outside, can be inside. We need to know our hazards so we can plan ways to reduce the risk this hazard would be to us. Now the operating surface. It is important that we are driving on good condition flat surfaces. Most forklifts are designed to drive on a flat, level, hard surface. But you might find that a company has come along, dug a trench in your backyard, filled it back in, you're not going to drive a forklift in there. You drive over that filled in trench, your forklift could end up getting bogged, tipping over. A lot of things could happen. You've got damaged or cracked, cracked bitumen or concrete on your driveway. Again, that could cause your forklift to be unstable. You can end up tipping your forklift up for, with that. You've got hard compact surfaces like soft soil, uh, hard soil could turn into mud, come into, uh, end up slipping or sliding on it. Railway tracks, you want to avoid railway tracks. Rough, uneven sloping surfaces. We've also got steel dock edges, ramps and grates. Every forklift needs to have a data plate on it. To know what your forklift is able to lift, to know its capacity, you need to know how much you can lift vertically, tilted forward, you need to know your load centre distance on the forklift. Your data plate has many, lots of different information on it. It has make and model, attachment types, load centre distance, maximum lift height, serial number, weight of the forklift, rated capacity, both capacity for both forward, vertical and tilt forward. It also has tyre types, type of wheels, how much you can tilt forward, what's your distance, etc. There's a lot of information in there. The main thing you do need to know though is your capacity of your forklift. 
Now, your capacity can be affected several ways. One is about the height you lift. Most forklifts are rated to about four and a half metres up to five metres. Anything beyond that, you'll find that the capacity reduces down. Why? Because the higher you go at the mast, the more leverage that load has on your forklift. You've got your load centre. Your load centre is too far forward, can reduce the capacity of your forklift. The further away your load centre is from your point of balance, the less weight your forklift can carry. Also, that applies to your tilt forward, because you're doing the same thing. You're moving your load centre further away from your point of balance on your forklift. So that will affect your capacity of your forklift. Now, checking the capacities, you can read this data plate. You'll see my load centre is 600 millimetres. My lift height is 3,700 millimetres. The capacity vertically is 1,575 kilos. My lift height, my lift capacity uh, tilt forward is reduced to 900 kilos. Load centre distance. Let's talk a little bit about load centre distance. Load centre distance is the measurement from the vertical face of the forks to the centre gravity of the load. Okay, how do I work the load centre distance out? Calculating the load centre distance is the length of the load you divide it by two. In this particular case you've got 1000 millimetres, divide 1000 millimetres by two gives you 500 millimetres. This forklift within the capacity of the forklift. Uh, forklift. Let's look at this load now. This load 1500 millimetres wide, divide 1500 by two gives you 700 millimetres. That is outside the capacity of the forklift. Things that can affect your load centre distance would be the load not pushed right up against the heel of the forks. Your load centre is too far forward, which could cause the forklift to tip over forwards because it's creating leverage on the front of the fork. An odd shape load could affect your load centre distance. In that case, you'll have to measure the load up and calculate where your load centre distance to make sure it's within the 600 millimetres. In most cases, it will be an unevenly, unevenly stacked pallet. Obviously, you're going to measure the pallet out or the load out. You'll find out the length of the load and then you'll pick that load up from the heavy side. Why? Because your load centre distance will be on the heavier side. Path of travel. Now we talked about planning your route earlier and about things you have to plan before we're using the forklift. In this case, we've broken one of those categories down. Now, planning your travel path, planning the route you'll take. There are things you'll need to plan on that route. Is there enough ventilation and fresh air? When should you sound the horn? Will you need to reverse? Are there any ramps or slopes? Where will you have to stop? Where should you slow down? What's a safe speed limit? Are there any places you can't go? Where will the pedestrians be? Is there, enough, um, is there a suitable place to place the load? We need to consider all these things before we start using that forklift. Again, it's all about reducing the risk to the danger of the forklift. Operating a forklift. You need to be alert when operating a forklift. You cannot be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Illegal drugs or legal drugs. You can't be overtired driving that machine. If you're overtired, you're not alert. If you're on medication, uh, that's been prescribed by the doctor that makes you tired you're not alert again consumed alcohol you had a party the night before and you jump on the forklift you're still drunk it's not on you're not alert having taken illegal drugs again not not uh, you're not alert refueling and recharging now there are two types of forklifts out there you've got a combustion engine and you've got an electric forklift. Both are dangerous when refueling or when recharging. Refueling. 
you're putting fl uh, flammable liquids into an engine. What could go wrong? A lot of things. If you've got that engine running and it, it creates a spark or the fuel lands on a hot part of the motor, you're going to start yourself a fire. So when you refuel your forklift, gas, LPG, um, fuel, petrol, diesel, any of that, you must make sure your engine's off, you're not using any mobile phones, you're not smoking to refuel that engine. Reduce the risk of a fire happening. Same when you charge a battery. A lot of people do not know. When you charge an electric battery, it produces a gas called hydrogen combined with oxygen. So two gases are being released. If there's a small spark, you can ignite the hydrogen, which will create an explosion. You want to be charging your battery in an area with good airflow. Overhead power lines. Overhead power lines. There are two types of power lines that we need to worry about here. We've got poles, which are taking electricity to house to house, factory to factory. There are also towers, which take electricity to town to town. Okay, you go on a country drive, you see those large towers taking electricity from one town to the next town. We've got restricted zones in those areas where we can work as an operator as of a forklift or any high-risk high license operating a forklift or operating a crane. The distance that we need to maintain from poles is an area called a no-go zone. That area is three metres from the power lines out, three metres from the power lines down and nowhere above the power lines. We can work anywhere between three to 6.4 metres with a licensed spotter. Outside, outside 6.4 metres is an open zone. Towers, a similar format, eight metres from the power lines and out, nowhere above and eight metres below is your no-go zone. Anywhere between eight and 10 metres is where you can work with a licensed spotter. Outside 10 metres is your open zone. Working closer to power lines than the minimum safe distances. Victoria have got their own rules. Other states may be different. Okay. If you want to work inside the no-go zone, the only way you can work inside the no-go zone is ask the power company to switch off the power lines. And if they cannot turn the power lines off, you may have the power lines covered by insulation. In Victoria, we will not get permission to work closer to power lines than the minimum safe distances. You may in other states or territories ask your local power company. Tiger tails, markers, poles, power line markers are only visual aids. They are not insulation. They're to indicate the power lines there, make them easier to see so you can maintain your safe distances. You even got signage that you can put up just to make it easier to see so you can maintain your safe distances from the power lines. You still have to follow the rules and laws. Most warehouses have to have a standard lighting of anywhere between 80 to 160 lux. You need good lighting in the area so you can see everything clearly so you can work safely. Spaces. We talked earlier about the two different types of forklifts that we have. We've got a combustion engine and we've got an electric forklift. Each have got their own purpose. Let's talk about the combustion engine. The combustion engine produces carbon monoxide. So if you take a combustion engine into a small freezer, small fridge, a small storage shed, a container, 
it's going to produce carbon monoxide. It's going to fill those areas up with carbon monoxide, which can end up killing us, which could, we could end up dying if we don't get help. In those areas, we use an electric-powered forklift, either electric or hydrogen-powered. Hydrogen, hydrogen-powered forklifts aren't very familiar, but there's a few out there. But either electric or hydrogen. Combustion engines which run on diesel, petrol, LPG or compressed natural gas, we would not use them in small areas like containers, fridges, uh, sheds, anywhere small. PPE. PPE is the last line of defence. It's not to eliminate the hazard, it's to reduce the risk of something hurting, injuring or harming me. You still got to use common sense even though you're using PPE. Different types of PPE out there, you've got hard hat, safety glass, glasses, you've got sunscreen, earmuffs, safety shoes, long pants, long sleeve, dust mask, high visibility clothing. The two main pieces of PPE you use while using a forklift is your boots and your vest. Safety shoes to protect your feet from falling objects, crushing your toes. Safety helmet protects your head from falling objects. Glasses from flying objects like sparks or nail guns, something in the area. Dust masks to stop you from breathing in toxic, dusty, um, dusty dust going into your lungs, toxic chemicals. Rear end swing. What is forklift rear end swing? It is the fast sideways movement of the rear end of the forklift. It can hit people, vehicles and structures. So what is creating rear end swing? Forklift steer with the rear tyres, which creates the rear end swing. The rear end of the forklift will swing around fast and rapidly. How do we control rear end swing? Well, we separate the forklifts from pedestrians and vehicles. How do we separ separate them? Well, we put up vehicle exclusion zones and pedestrian exclusion zones. We can put up warning signs. We can put up barricades and bollards. We use a flag person. We can use flashing hazard lights. If we're going to use a flag person for traffic, the flag person needs to be a licensed traffic controller. Communicating. Communicating what you've done in the workplace. You need to communicate that to your supervisor, maybe your OHS representative. You need to confirm your task requirements. How, how would you confirm your task requirements? Well, you should make sure that anything you have planned for the uh, planned for in the work area is in line with workplace policies and procedures. This includes things like your site inspection, assessing the operating surface, the suitability of the load, uh, forklift for the load, path of operating the forklift, hazard and control measures that you've put in place, traffic managements and communications. Uh, if you're unsure, always refer to your workplace policies and procedures or speak to the appropriate person for the information. Part 1, please watch part 2. Thank you for watching.